Earnings season is winding down and three of the companies that I own and follow closely, I haven't hit on yet. That's because I went on vacation during the middle of it. Those three companies are Pubmatic, Axon Enterprises and Unity Software. So how did they do during their quarters and what am I going to do with my own holdings? Well, that's what we're going to get to over the next half hour. My name is Brian Stoffel. Thanks so much for joining me. And if you have questions about any of these three companies as we go through, write them down below. And if we have time at the end, I'm going to cut us off at a half hour, but I'll answer as many of those questions as I can. So let's dive in. We'll start with Pubmatic. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is a tool that allows digital content creators to place ads on their sites. It's otherwise known as a sell side platform. It is a definitely a small cap company valued at just $1 billion. And here's how they did during their earnings. They announced that revenue grew 27%, which is definitely less than it was during the peak of the pandemic, but it actually accelerated from the prior quarter and is well above their baseline that they shoot for of 20% growth. Looking ahead, a lot of that growth came in a couple specific areas. One is mobile and omnichannel video. The other is connected TV. Display growth, which just shows up on your computers, your desktop computers, uh, was more modest. But these areas, mobile and connected TV, are going to be important to watch going forward. Now, the company's net dollar-based retention rate remains strong. Maybe not as strong as it was during the depths of the pandemic and lockdowns, but still very good. Again, 130% means that uh, Pubmatic not only held on to all of its customers from last year, but even if we exclude all the new customers they got, those existing customers spent 30% more. That's a great sign. It shows that they are delivering on what their customers want. Gross profit also grew, albeit at a slower pace. And it's important to understand why those gross margins went from 74 down to 70. Pomatic owns its own servers. It doesn't rent out space on, public, on the public cloud. Now that is very expensive up front. And because Pomatic sees a very long runway for growth, it is spending on those servers now. That will cut down on gross profit in the short term, but ideally in the long run, that should generate even more cash flow. We'll get to what that means in a second, but it is important to note that despite spending so much on those servers, the company is free cash flow positive. They generated $20 million in cash from operations. And after you take out the capital expenditures, they generated $6 million in free cash flow. That's not a ton, but this is a very small and growing company that is free cash flow positive. Now, I want to talk about this slide real quick. The number of ad impressions continues to grow at an impressive clip, especially given that there has been somewhat of a pullback uh, since society started opening up and we're dealing with inflation and the possibility of a prolonged recession right now. That's what's on the left. On the right hand side, this is really important. The cost of revenue per 1 million ad impressions is coming down. This is where the benefit of owning those servers comes in. Again, expensive on the front end gets cheaper over time, and we want to see that continue. These two forces playing together should help the company generate lots of free cash flow moving forward. So what am I going to do about this stock? Well, first, what am I going to watch? I'm going to watch that dollar-based retention. I'd like to see it stay above 110 115%. That would definitely be a positive sign. Number two, connected TV and mobile are really important. Content creators, Brian Froley and I are content creators. We do stuff on YouTube. They are uh, especially powerful over these two modes of delivery. And so we want to check on these two. Third, that slide I just showed you. We want to see ad impressions grow while the cost per million ad impressions continues to go down. That will tell us that the company does have somewhat of a low cost advantage, not a big one because there are other players that can do this but it's still important for their profitability and third free cash flow. It's been positive. We want to see it continue to be positive. Overall, I believe the moat is widening and I think the thesis is very much on track. Now, for me, this is a position that is about, uh, as of my last check, about 2.4% of my real life holdings. I think this is the kind of stock that I wouldn't mind adding to in the future. That's not a promise that I'm going to do that, but if I have extra cash, this is on the short list of stocks that I'm going to look to add. Now, if you're thinking about doing the same thing, I just want to call out that 
I don't look at valuation, but I know a lot of you do. And so Brian and I have started to include this in our videos. We think right now Pomatic is between the launch and the hyper growth phase, which means that gross profit and gross sales are really the only things that this company is optimized for. I would say not even gross profit because they're spending so much on those servers. That being said, right now Pubmatic trades for about four times trailing sales. That is medium high compared to the market. Um, it is definitely low compared to Pubmatic uh, historically. On a gross profit basis, again, this isn't a perfect metric, but it's trading for about between five and six times gross profit. Overall, I think this is a very high quality company. I believe that they have a moat in terms of both network effects, switching costs, maybe a teeny tiny one in terms of low cost uh, advantage. And I think they've got lots of skin in the game. They're in a very solid financial position. So it's got an 11. No surprise why I like owning this stock. Let's move to our second stock, which is a stock that has long been one of my favorites to own, Axon Enterprise. For those of you not familiar, this used to be Taser International, making the stun guns that police forces use. They've moved on to Axon body cameras. And most important from my perspective, the software services that they can use given all the data that they collect. It's about an $8.6 billion company. And during the second quarter, sales grew 31%. That's very healthy. Gross profit, not as fast. Now, this is not surprising. The product mix that Axon sells can be very lumpy. One quarter can be lots of software, not a whole lot of taser and body cameras. Software tends to be higher margin. Another quarter can be a lot of body cameras and not a lot of tasers. Body cameras tend to be lower margin. So this is not terribly surprising. It's more instructive to look over the long term. And over the long term, I believe that they're pretty stable. Um, it is worth noting that income from operations went from a loss of $94 million in the year ago quarter to a gain of $21 million. Woohoo! Well, uh, not that exciting. The main reason is stock-based compensation. They gave out a ton of it in the year ago quarter, a lot less this quarter. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is not a surprise. This is something that it is important to get used to with Axon. Their CEO and founder, uh, Rick Smith, gave up his salary a number of years ago in favor of a compensation package that is much like Elon Musk at Tesla, where he gets compensated through generous uh, stock options. And, um, and that is when they hit certain benchmarks. They hit a bunch of them in the year ago quarter. So that's why there was so much. And he's offering a similar plan to some employees as well. So that's just something you need to know if you're getting into Axon. It's definitely something that I'm willing to deal with. Um, now let's go through each segment because this is important. First, the stun guns, the tasers. Sales were up 20%, which is very strong. Um, margins did contract a little bit. That is not something to get super worried about. In terms of the body cameras, sales were up 50%. And look, at, these body cameras are becoming mandated across the states and the globe. Municipalities, counties, state uh, police forces are starting to mandate these. Um, the reasons for that are unfortunate, but their utility is pretty much undeniable. You turn on the news and you're bound to see that axon symbol in the corner eventually. Um, gross margins also expanded during the quarter beyond what they shoot for. So don't be surprised to see that come back in the future. But for me, the all important one is the software services. And I'm going to detail what those are in just a second. But sales were up 35% while margins decreased as they're investing in these platforms because there's new ones that they're continually rolling out. Um, Overall, their annual recurring revenue is up 42%. That's very strong. Net revenue retention of 119% means they're not only holding on to their existing customers, but getting those existing customers to spend 19% more per year and then adding those existing customers in there. So this is a very strong company and they're signing longer contracts. Their total future contracted revenue now sits at over $3.3 billion. That is 63% higher than the same time last year. So this, this remains one of my highest conviction holdings. Um, now, I want to talk about these three, you see with the green circle over here, these three software services. Evidence.com, that is where you can download all the uh, footage that you get on these body cameras and you can analyze and search them. Axon Records, that allows 
for a lot of paperwork to be auto filled for officers by using artificial intelligence and what the sensors, the sensors being the axon cameras collect so that the police can spend more time out in the community, less time behind the desk filling out paperwork. And axon dispatch allows officers responding to a situation to have a centralized way of knowing where everyone is and what's going on. And these are evidence, I did it in order, evidence is the oldest, dispatch is the newest, and these are gaining traction. So what will I be watching moving forward? First, those three cloud products I talked about. The switching costs are enormous. Once they are in a police department, they're not going anywhere. So that's really important. Second, the total amount of contracted revenue I'm going to watch. That 63% growth figure was very impressive, and it shows that people are willing to sign these long-term contracts. Third, stock-based compensation. Again, that's a pill that I'm willing to swallow. Not everyone is, but keep your eye on it. And third, free cash flow. The company is free cash flow positive. Overall, the moat direction is definitely widening here, and I think that the thesis is very much on track. Axon is about 6.6% of my portfolio. Now, once a stock gets above 5%, I don't add to it anymore. That's just what works for me. I'm not saying anyone else should do that. But if it was below 5%, you can bet I would be adding. Again, I don't worry too much about valuation. Others do. So let's take a look at valuation. Axon, it's a little bit difficult to do because it's hard to know where they're at. They're kind of between launch and hyper growth. They're kind of between hyper growth and maturity because they keep adding these new services that cost a lot up front, like these software services, but then they take off and they've got a wide moat. But when the company reports earnings, we've got to throw the tasers and the body cameras in there too. So let's just look at the different metrics. On a price to sales basis, Axon trades between eight and nine times sales. That's expensive compared to the average stock market component. It's a little bit above average based on Axon's history. Price to gross profit is trading for about 14. That's pretty expensive, although you can see gross profit has gone off swiftly over the last five years. On a price to earnings ratio, it trades for about 62 times earnings. That stock-based compensation really skews this, so it's not terribly useful. And the company is investing a ton in their software solutions and also their headquarters. They're pulling back on those headquarters spending because the pandemic taught them that they can actually have a lot of a remote workforce, but that means lots of capital expenditures and the price to free cash flow really is not terribly uh, instructive. Now we're going to get to Unity, which is the big one. It's going to take the most amount of time. But before we get to that, I just want to call one thing out. Brian Feroldi and I are teaching our second cohort. We're very excited about this. Our class is called Financial Statements Explained Simply. Enrollment opened up this past weekend, and I'll be honest, seats are going much faster than we expected, about three to four times faster. However, if you are interested in learning how to read financial statements, this two-week course we believe will help you get there. I was a middle school teacher who had no idea how to do this 10 years ago, and I've made it for someone like myself at that time. Now, this isn't in the show notes. If you want to apply to the class, the link is in the show notes. But this is the part not in the show notes. If you put the code EARLY250, EARLY is in all caps and the number is 250 with no spaces, you can get a $250 discount on the course. Click out the show notes for that. Now, let's move on to Unity. And boy, oh boy, do we have a lot to talk about with this. This is a $13.5 billion company, and it has a platform that allows game developers and those working with virtual reality and augmented reality to create games or other services. They also have an arm that allows them to monetize those games. So for the quarter, their create solutions, that is where they help game developers and people in adjacent industries create an augmented or virtual world. The tools that you use for this are on a subscription basis and revenue is up 66%. That is very impressive. Operate Solutions is down was down 13%. Now that was not terribly surprising. I just need to rewind a bit to talk about what's happening here. Operate Solutions announced at the beginning of the year that they ran into some trouble where they digested bad data. And because of that, they didn't show very good ads for the people that were running their games on Unity's platform. Because of that, 
they got less money and Unity got a less of a cut of it. Now, they said that they were working on a solution. I don't know if this is really the way it works out, but I get the feeling that a big part of this was because of Apple's privacy changes and Unity thought that they had a workaround and then they didn't, which kind of leads into the fact that the company announced a merger with Iron Source and then had another uh, offer from AppLovin. We'll talk about those in a second, but I want to get back to the quarter's results first. So when we look at Operate Solutions, that's not surprising that it was down 13%, but Create Solutions was up 16% or 66%, and that's crazy. If we look at it, they also said that 40% of that revenue is coming from industries outside of gaming. That's a huge part of the investment thesis in this company. Now, I saw that and thought to myself, that's impressive. But how much of that is organic? Because Weta or Weta, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but the design studio that helped make things like Avatar, uh, the movie, was acquired by Unity in December of last year. So obviously that acquisition is going to add some of that growth. And when I looked through the conference call and I looked through the investor presentation, I wasn't able to see anything about, is this organic? Is it not organic? What's going on? Why didn't anyone ask? So I wrote to Investor Relations about this, and they actually got back to me very quickly, and they said this. And I'm going to show a slide because it kind of explains what they said. They said that they don't really monitor whether it was organic or not, and it's because of this. Weta or Weta Digital is anchoring their approach to advanced creations for artists. And what that means is that they have a package now that combines the tools that they already had in Create Solutions and they took tools from this acquisition and added it to that package. I can see how that makes it difficult for the company to know, well, how much of this is organic and how much of it isn't. I think they could have been clear about that. I'm not crazy about that, but I am willing to give them the benefit of the doubt there. Now, they said also that this acquisition with Iron Source, the thing to understand about Iron Source is really this is a way for them to try and just, quote unquote, fix the operate side of the business get those game developers to be able to monetize their games using uh, using Unity's platform. I wasn't crazy about the terms of the deal, um, but I, I, I've i warmed to it a little bit. Uh, if we look at the company's guidance moving forward, they said that they're going to grow about 13.5% in the third quarter, and then that will accelerate uh, for the full year. Their operating income will be negative. Look, they're paying a lot for this acquisition, although they did get an infusion of cash from some of their investors as well. What am I going to watch moving forward? First is that operate revenue. Management is really, really testing investor patience with this, and they've got to show that they can fix this problem. Second, create revenue. I don't expect 66% growth moving forward, but I'll be honest, that is a key part of my decision about what to do with this company, which I'll get to in a second. Third, Merger decisions. The company decided to reject App Lovin's offer, and App Lovin would basically be the one who would come in and fix the operate side of the business and say that they plan on moving forward with the Iron Source merger. And fourth, free cash flow. I want to see this return to being positive and growing. Overall, I'd say the moat direction is stable. I, it seems like, although I can't tease out how much of this is because of the Weta acquisition, it seems like the create side of Unity is widening its moat. It seems like the operate side has seen its moat plummet. Um, so overall, that's why I'm saying stable. And I think that I have a yellow flag and I wrote on track. Better word might have been cautiously optimistic. So what am I going to do about Unity? Well, what I'm going to do is this has fallen so much that it's now just 2.6% of my portfolio. That's half of what I would consider a full position. If it was more than that, if it was a for me like an 8% position, there have been enough hiccups in this that I would say, mm, I'm going to pull back on that. And that's just what works for me. I'm not suggesting anybody else do that. But with it being so small and with the potential in create, the potential in operate, I'm willing to hold for now. In the past, I've been burned by decisions like this where it seems like I'm being too optimistic. And that might happen here. We will wait and see. And it will be a learning process. When we look at the company's valuation, it, this is a tough one to value. Again, not quite sure where I would say this is, kind of in the hyper growth phase, although the pullback in that operate is, is really dragging this down. If you look at price to sales, it's trading for about 11 times sales. That's 
high compared to the market, low compared to Unity's past. Price to gross profit, this is very expensive, 15 times gross profit. It's not even worth looking at free cash flow. Um, overall, this definitely took a step down on my framework. It scored a nine and a half now because the Operate Solutions was having so much trouble. So that is where I stand now on all of these companies. Um, Axon, I think is very strong. I would have added to, but it's already 5%. Pubmatic, very strong. It's on my short list to consider adding to. Unity, very disappointing so far, first half of the year. If it was a bigger part of my portfolio, I'd probably trim. It's already a small part, so I'm just going to leave it where it is. And with that, I want to see if we have some time for questions. And I'm just going to start at the top and go down. If you'd like to ask a questions, go ahead and put it in uh, to the side and we'll get a chance to do that. The first comes from Samuel who said, what are the core traits of a growth investor? Keys to success. What I would say as a growth investor is you've got to have an even keel. Being a growth investor is a roller coaster ride. And if you can't, if your emotions go up and down with it, it's okay to do something that's much simpler, like buying an index fund. The keys, I'd say what I just said, as well as keep a long term mindset. That might sound simple, but I think those are the keys. Um, let's see. I understand that you advocate buying long term, uh, but the market has shown extreme volatility with massive drawdowns on growth. Do I ever consider using stop losses? No, I don't. The main reason that I don't is that I just look at this as I don't know what's going to happen. You know, a funny thing happened before I went on vacation for two weeks and was gone for two weeks. And before I left, I said to Brian Feroldi, I think the earnings season that's coming, we're going to see a, a whole bunch of companies report some pain and we're going to see stocks really come down a whole bunch and then and then the pain will be done. And lo and behold, what ended up happening while I was gone was the exact opposite. Keep an investment journal and you will learn time and time again that you cannot predict the future. So the thing is about, about uh, stop losses is that I might have that in place, but as a long-term growth investor, getting back into those stocks and knowing when to get back into them, that is a lot harder than you might think. So that's why I don't do that. Um, let's see. I have a question here about what is wrong with Peloton stock? Is it worth it to reconsider considering how cheap it seems? For me, no, because... Uh, Look, the key part of the company, what I didn't understand well when I made my investment, and we made a video on this, was that the bikes and the treadmills were too important to the company's bottom line and top line growth. And those just didn't have a moat around them. And so I just said it, it was time to part ways. Could I go back to it? Maybe, but I'm not going to right now. I don't think that the company is anti-fragile. The valuation doesn't matter to me very much, but I understand that it matters to a lot of other investors. Um, let's see. Word from the game developer community is they don't love this acquisition and it seems to be a hit on the Unity brand name. And Stefan, I, I get that. Um, I think that game developers and artists in general hate it when the, the company that makes the tools that they use starts to commercialize. I totally get it. Same thing happens with Etsy. Um, we're going to see whether they vote with their feet, though, because in the end, voting with their dollars and voting with their feet, that's what uh, really shows, you know, the value that Unity's platform has. So we'll keep an eye on that, create revenue. And if that starts to tick down, that would show that they, they don't like it so much and they've got an alternative that it is time to reconsider that investment. Um, I have one in here about why I chose Pubmatic over Trade Desk. Honestly, it's just one that I was able to understand better, but there's nothing wrong with owning either one of these. Um, let's see. So disappointed with Unity's management. Let me tell you something. I am too. I, I don't feel like they've been as forthcoming as possible. Um, and I do think that their stock-based compensation is not great. I, I would not mind to see the management team replaced. I do know that the two, two of the co-founders of Unity are still on board. Of Kimante is the chief technology officer. And then uh, I can't remember his uh, first name, but Helgeson is on the board of directors. They were two of the co-founders. I would not mind seeing them take over a leadership role or when this if this iron source deal goes through, seeing the iron source management take over. I, I just, I haven't been impressed with what's going on. And I don't think that management does a great job of explaining what's going on. And I do think that they are compensating themselves quite well. So 
that that I I feel you on that. Um, let's. I'm just going down. And Jay Z uh, asks, um, "Do I do technical analysis? No, I don't do any technical analysis. I know. I believe that the future is completely unknowable. There are a couple things that will happen over the next 20 years that are going to affect all of the stock returns between now and then. I only care about what happens to my portfolio between now and then. And I want to have anti-fragile companies that at least have tipped the scale, the scales are tipped in their favor to benefit from chaos rather than deteriorate from it. So I don't think that technical analysis helps me to do that. Uh, Danny asks, are there any other gaming stocks that I would consider buying, like take two or Ubisoft? Not really, um, but, but I'm not huge into gaming. I loved what Unity had in terms of an anti-fragile perspective. And look, so far that hasn't worked out very well. So maybe I need to do some more time in this area. Um, and then last one, did I add to my positions before or after earnings were out? No, uh, I did not in any of these companies do that. Um, so that's where it sits. Um, though that's how Unity, Axon and Pubmatic did during their quarter that I plan on holding all three, potentially adding more to Pubmatic I would do the same with Axon if I didn't already own so much. I hope that this half hour session was helpful to you. Again, if you're interested in our course, click on the show notes below. Thanks for coming. Brian, 